you. Good. So are you here with a group on vaping? Yeah. You are? Yeah. Would you mind introducing yourselves to us? Where are you from? Burlington. Good place to be. <laughs> so I understand you have something going on at 11 o'clock or not. In, in room 11? Or? Yeah. You do. So we, we're, going to, we're going to identify one or two people who can leave this committee and go with you into room 11. Are you supposed to be in there at 11? Yeah. Okay. So we'll do that. I don't know that all of us can go, but we will have our representatives with you. Okay. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I have and who would like to go? I would like to go. I have all right. several Wait, have. Senator McCormick and Senator Cummings will represent us well. Mm -hmm. And they will mention the other three senators who are <laughs> unable to be here. We'll be back in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll take them. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, Jen, yes. you have something for us. I do. Uh, so just, a, just FYI, when I opened it up last night, um, I saw bold. I didn't see yellow. Can you see it now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me find. Yes, so like, on page five. Oh, when I do, I've got yellow. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nice Perfect. if you don't. Depending on what you look for when you open it in, you can see the markup either. So why don't we just skip to the yellow? Okay. Do you want to do that? Sure. So Jennifer Carvey, Legislative Council. Um, so I am going to show you all of the things that have changed since the last draft, which reflects things you talked about on Friday and a few things you didn't talk about on Friday. Um, so the first is on page five. Um, I have added in, for purposes of amending it, the definition of tobacco substitute, which is our statutory language for e-cigarette. Um, and I tried to do this. I, I was. Um, I know there's interest among some of the advocates to move to somebody else's definitions. Um, I think our definitions have worked well for us. They, they don't, do not seem to be problematic, but I was um, trying to anticipate some of the issues either that they were bringing or that may be coming um, coming online soon, new, whether it's new products or new ways of um, using e-cigarettes. So I um, made some changes to the definition of tobacco substitute. Uh, some of it is just to put it in the singular because tobacco substitute should mean something singular. Tobacco substitute means any product including an electronic cigarette or other electronic or battery powered device. So that's all just putting it in singular. Mm -hmm. But then I added, uh, or any component, part, or accessory thereof. Um, so any part of an electronic or cigarette or other electronic or battery powered device that contains or is designed to deliver nicotine or other substances into the body through the inhalation, and then I added, or other absorption, because some, I, some of the literature suggests that people are uh, not actually inhaling it into their lungs, but holding it in their mouth and letting it absorb into the tissues. Um, of, and I added to be consistent with our, our e-liquid definition, aerosol, vapor, and then I also added, or other emission, in case it comes out in some other form that is neither aerosol or vapor, and that has not been approved by the FDA for tobacco cessation or other medical purposes. That's existing law. And of course, it, can, it maintains the language saying anything that is approved by the FDA for tobacco cessation or other medical purposes is not a tobacco substitute. Okay. So this does, this this still fits with what we have been using previously? Still fits with our existing language throughout the statutes on tobacco substitute, and uh, but it, it, so other than changing it from a plural definition going with a singular term to being a singular definition going with a singular term, um, the things that I added are um, the concept of any component, part, or accessory of a tobacco substitute, because there seem to be different pieces um, and they all kind of fit with what you're talking about. Um, and also adding this concept of absorption in a manner other than inhalation and um, inhalation or absorption of aerosol or other emission in addition to vapor. So okay. trying to be a little bit broader in order to capture what might be coming. Down the pipe. Right. Um, and similarly in the definition of e-liquid, I um, 
modified other for emissions since aerosol and vapor seem to be emissions, um, to be inhaled and I added or otherwise absorbed by the user. So this is a solution substance or other material used in or with a tobacco substitute that is heated or otherwise acted upon to produce an aerosol vapor or other emission to be inhaled or otherwise absorbed by the user regardless of whether the liquid contains nicotine. And maybe we should even change liquid contains nicotine to whether the substance. material. We say solution, yeah. substance, or other material. And maybe we say it's your liquid. Right. Mm -hmm. So again, trying to be as broad yet specific as possible. So happy to entertain other suggestions. I missed things. All right. So then we go through um, with no changes until page nine. And this is where I took out the possession. Um, and so because you were leaving in the prohibition on the purchase, I changed the section heading to say persons under 21 years of age purchase of, to of tobacco products rather than possession. And then misrepresenting age, and I'm just fixing that typo. I keep identifying, but not fixing. Mm -hmm. for Why did we do that? Products. Why did we make that change? To get rid of possession? Yeah. Um, you had, that was what you had asked for on I know that. I Friday. Why. Um, I think in part because you were looking to not have a penalty for possession. Um, you had heard testimony from some advocates with concerns about penalizing what they considered an addiction right. for minors. Yes, yeah, so this is the one that we talked about on Friday. Right. Yeah, I, I was just asking for a review yeah, of that right. talk. So that's my I remember that we talked about yeah, yeah. it. I was asking for so a review I of the talk. Also flag this for the Economic Development Committee where I was just doing a bit of an overview um, so they're aware of this in your current draft. And this does fall in, within their jurisdiction, this, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the uh, enforcement pieces. Yeah, right now they're working on just getting their heads around the whole concept and, and, and what the market looks like and stuff. Regardless of where they are. Um, so then I, so I took out the possession language and then we didn't need the language saying unless the person, uh, I didn't think we needed it, is an employee of a holder of a tobacco license and is in possession of the products to affect a sale in the course of employment. So if the ban is just on purchase or attempting to purchase, then we don't need an exemption for the underage employee. Um, similarly, in subsection B, um, the, the penalty, which is currently on possession, would apply to the purchase or attempt to purchase tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, e-liquids, or tobacco paraphernalia. This is the civil penalty of $25, brought in the same manner as a traffic violation because it's Judicial Bureau. I did um, check in yesterday and got confirmation um, from the judicial branch that um, it does not have an impact on a, on a light just because something goes through the Judicial Bureau and is handled in the same manner as a traffic violation unless it is a traffic violation uh, or otherwise specifies that there would be an effect on their driver's license okay. or ability to operate that there is not an automatic connection there. And it doesn't have all, you put all kinds of surcharges on traffic violation. There may be, so there are some charges that can get added based on when a person pays the bill or waiver no, we, penalty we, and all that, but, but nothing that is, I mean, the, yeah. the, tra the structure of the traffic tickets itself does not okay. apply here. There so are, and this is a new charge, so we wouldn't. This itself is not a new charge. This is actually an existing okay. provision, but you I do just, have a new charge later in the ban on retail sale. Okay. I just want to make sure, because for a while, putting a surcharge on traffic, I think we funded clerks, we funded, I think, some victims' rights. There were several surcharges. There are, I mean, there are some surcharges, waiver penalties in the Judicial Bureau chapter, but but anything that was in the traffic violation statute specifically is not here. Automatically, okay, I just want to make sure we think we're putting twenty five, but there's already five hundred dollars worth of surcharges on any fee. So, 
as long as I, so this is it, this is it. So you may want to hear from someone in the judicial branch or specific to the Judicial Bureau about what this, how this all plays out. I was trying to look at the statutes and their information available online, but it's hard to get a specific Who amount. And if you can't imagine, we can, we can we'll find out. Yeah, I yeah, mean, we should judge person or, or somebody on his behalf. Yeah, we should do that. Just to understand what your what happens there. But again, that's an existing provision, so right, that's right. nothing new. Right. Uh, except to taking out the, the possession penalty. Um, on page 12, I just corrected what I think was a, a typo omission in striking from the last version, looking at the contraband and seizure, um, and uh, expanding from all cigarettes or other tobacco products seized under the contraband and seizure section would be destroyed. Uh, we changed it to items, but the cigarette and tobacco product language was not struck through. So I think that is just a conforming change. On pages 14 and 15, this is the uh, liquid, what is currently liquid nicotine packaging and the requirement that it be in childproof packaging. Um, I just changed it to use the terminology of e-liquids containing nicotine and the packaging for that. So uh, was not looking to make any substantive changes there, but just being consistent with your language throughout the chapter. And then we get to the flavor ban in section um, 1013, which starts on page 15, but the changes are actually on, not until page 17. So the first thing on page 17 is the addition of a definition of tobacco retailer. This was to address the concern of the advocates that, um, that it not be the clerk who at the um, store who gets the penalty, but that the penalty go to the owner, operator, or manager of the retail establishment. So this would define retailer, a tobacco retailer as any individual, partnership, joint venture, society, club, trustee, trust, association, organization, or corporation who owns, operates, or manages any retail establishment that has a tobacco license from the Division of Liquor Control. Um, then in subsection B, it is no person, so broader, um, shall engage, and remember when you talked on Friday, you narrowed it from uh, the se from selling, offering to sell, give, giving, providing, transporting, manufacturing, or otherwise distributing to just the retail sale. So this would prohibit the re no person shall engage in the retail sale of any flavored tobacco product, flavored e-liquid, or flavored tobacco substitute but then the penalty in subsection C would be on the retailer. So somebody can go across the border and buy stuff. And somebody can go across the border and buy it, and bring it back, and hand them out, or potentially sell them because the and there won't be tobacco a license <laughs> re requirement re right. uh, applies to retail sale. Um, so, so the bus from the senior center goes to Aquasazi and somebody yes. buys a case of cigarettes and gives it to their friend, they aren't going to... It's a gift. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I may want to look at the language in subsection C a little bit more just as far as the change from person to tobacco, to tobacco retailer to make it clear that if it happens at the store, then it's a penalty on the owner, operator, or manager, but uh, even if it's the clerk who does the selling. Right? So I think that, if, so I mean, assuming that is your intent, I think it's not quite clear with the way I've done it, um, that it doesn't have to be that owner or person who, who affects the sale, but if it's a clerk who affects the sale for that owner, it's really their job to enforce with their employees. Okay. say if a person violates this so section, are you, are you gonna fix that the, yes, the tobacco retailer. I think maybe that's how I'll do it. Retailer. If a person violates this section, the tobacco retailer shall be subject to a civil penalty of not more than $100 for a first offense and not more than $500 for any subsequent offense. All right. And then, um, bottom of the page in the Judicial Bureau existing 
jurisdiction over violations of um, under current law, possession of tobacco products by a person under 21 years of age, I changed it to purchase to match your, uh, your change or elimination of the penalty for possession under age. And then on page 20, um, I, we had talked last time about potentially picking a date certain for the act to take effect so there was some predictability for retailers. Um, I put July 1st as a starting point, point, but by no means is that, I mean, there's no there's no reason it needs to be that date, I'm just starting with a, a date certain for you to look at. I know we, we put 21 in, in October. It was September 1st, September right, that was a, um, I think a compromise in the Human yeah. Services Committee. Right. So you could certainly use September 1st here or some other date. All right, questions for Jen on the, All right. She just bans menthol cigarettes. Yes. Okay. Bans, have, right. It bans the retail sale of okay. menthol cigarettes in the state. I have, but not the possession. Right. Because my concern is we haven't done primary seatbelt and a lot of other things because of concerns that that could generate into some actions that would that disadvantaged minorities, and we've talked a lot about minorities. Right. And I don't want a police officer having the ability to say, is that a menthol cigarette or is that a tobacco cigarette? We're going to go down to the station and talk about that. I also have concerns. To me, there's a fine line on the nanny state. I don't mind doing everything I can to prevent youth from being addicted. I have some concerns about where they may go, given that I'm told that hemp cigarettes are readily available and not taxed. Um, and God only knows what hemp cigarettes do. But there are adults who are addicted. There are adults who, whether or not we say clinically it's not, use cigarettes as a crutch, either for mental illness or other addictions, and to ask them to kick two addictions at once is probably more than I want to do. I'm also concerned about the tanks. So the, I, I, would, I think we need to review the data from uh, Dr. Polanski that indicates what will happen when uh, menthol is gone for adults. And some, it and also Dr. Uh, Gogo, let's put his name backwards, yeah. um, sorry, uh, on cardiovascular, and his, the data that he had on what happens with adults and, and the transition that occurs, either they quit or they continue smoking, playing um, cigarettes. So um, overall, you know, I think there is evidence that the, the limiting access to these products will. There is also evidence that drinking lots of vodka is not good for you, but you can buy strawberry shortcake flavored vodka and you can buy Boone's Farm. I know there was a lot of concern. And adults, adults have a right to make their own decisions knowing the risks. <laughs> And that's my concern. When do we step over the line okay. into the nanny state? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I've, been, I've never been more ambivalent about these legislation. Actually, in the four years I've been here, and I, and I, what you, what you have articulated is exactly what I'm thinking. But adults can, they can still buy anything that's not flavored. Um, you know, they can buy, they can buy a vaping product that's not flavored, they can buy cigarettes that are not. Um, so anyway, I guess I, but I, 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 I understand exactly what I, you mean. Yeah. I think we just need to do a vote count. So, let, so let's, um, 
the current language that Jen has brought us, the changes that Jen has brought us, are we okay with those changes? And then we will have some time to have the broader discussion about the bill as we go forward. And economic development is also doing an overview of the bill. And so they may have some recommendations. I don't know what they will be. But um, so on just the, the yellow, the yellow is fine. The yellow is fine. I will fix up that. Uh, I'm going to go and talk to my Andy Smokey. I, <laughs> I think you need to go do that. <laughs> okay. All right. I just, I, I'm going to go into room 11 too. I've, I've sent a lot of signals that I'm uh, supportive of, of the bill. And I, my concern has always been with the kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my sense is I, I really want to somehow separate the kids from the adults on this. Because, I mean, I, I do think if freedom means anything, it means it includes the right to make bad decisions. It's not, it's not for us to decide, even if it is a bad decision. And, and I want to give notice on that because I don't want to suddenly pull the rug out from people who I've, I've really given reason to think I'm... I'm going their way, because I kind of was, <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm, uh, my inner libertarian has come out here, okay. but I really do want to ban this for the kids, yes. and I'm not sure how we do that. What, so what we do know, the what we do know is when we went to 21, we had an escalation in access to menthol. We also do know uh, that um, the FDA in 2009 did not do its job and have, has left loopholes, a lot of loopholes, and one of which is menthol. So you can see where I am on this. So I think, um, and we will not be doing anything different from what the state I of think menthol on vapes is, is fine. And tobacco. We're going to have kids jumping to menthol tobacco. If it's out, if it's out there, they would I, I think they'll, and they're going to go to hemp, and they're going to go to marijuana, and they'll find something new. Those are something else to deal with. Yes. So I will say, this is where we're going to begin a conversation. Okay. Okay. So I would like for you, as I had, uh, as I started doing, um, reading through the testimony that we had on all of this and sorting out what happens to adults. If it, I mean, if your concern is adults, what happens to adults and how much do you want to pay for the cardiovascular events that go on or the emphysema that goes on because of access to menthol? And then what is the data related to quitting when menthol is not available because we have some of that data? A, a reluctance to have the government intervene in, in these dis decisions does not mean that you approve the decisions. Okay, I mean, remember way back when there was the whole issue. Well, our job here is to decide um, what, our, what, what our decision is on this bill and on the issue as it relates to flavors. I think, of the I think we all agree on electronic and debate. And yeah. um, the stumbling block I have is if if you smoked for 40 years, it, you're addicted, and it's a different place for me, those people, then. And I want to do everything I can amongst young people to get them um, to not put them in a position where they get stumbled. So we'll, we'll come back to this. Okay. And to know that there are people out there who have smoked for 40 years and they're on non-flavored. They're not, and they're, they're on unflavored, and they're still smoking. And some of them quit. And believe it or not, some of them, quit, especially when they start to feel the airways go. So, um, just a couple things. I know that you were bringing up the relationship between having flavored alcohol products and so on. But, uh, let's just remember that right now we have state-run liquor stores that keep all that stuff uh, secure. There are national uh, laws regarding the amount of alcohol proof contained in those alcohols. Mm -hmm. 
We don't have anything like that for nicotine. And the FDA is the one responsible for doing that. We don't doing it. Hemp. So there's a so to make draw that analogy, which I know that the the tobacco companies have done, is probably not uh, the best, most concrete analogy. You're making my argument on why why we should have a regulated market for cannabis. Well, for which. Cannabis. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I still want to know what we passed. Take that. the money and put it in the health department to mm -hmm. get Do the message. Well, that's what we're supposed to be doing with it, right? At least when the bill left the Senate, it was going into prevention and law enforcement. Right. We yes. weren't getting any. Right. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that point up, and then I would suggest you look at Andrea Galanti's um, data as well as uh, Dr. Um, Gogo's data about adults and children and when the high points of menthol cigarettes occur at what age. Um, so should we consider regulating mm -hmm. nicotine, the amount of nicotine? Mm -hmm. Instead? Well, yeah, we do. What, could, should we become the, the local FDA? Do you know how much that would cost? <laughs> I mean, this is the problem. Yeah. We don't, we're, we're, we're being held hostage to it by a uh, irresponsible federal government. Mm -hmm. In 2009, they were inundated with um, a tobacco lobby that just changed everything. And now we're made to believe that it was the right thing to do. Okay, so my sermon, sorry. All right, so. Um, The people are waiting to come in that door at 11.45, but we're going to start before we get here to listen to you, and we're thrilled that you're here. Um, so do you want to come up together, or do you want to speak separately? Or um, I think we can do it separately. I'll come up, and I'll give the overview of the presentation that we have, okay. and then Amy is going to talk about specifically how the program affects your school and the important Excellent. aspect of it. Okay. Um, so why don't you come up, um, Jennifer, Jennifer, Sarah. Sarah. And um, we'll introduce ourselves so you know who's who. Now. Great. Thank you. So, Senator. Ann Cummings, right here in Washington County. Great. Thank you. Rich Westman, I'm from Memorial County. Okay. Jenny Lyons, Chittenden County. Debbie Ingram, also Chittenden County. Dick McCormick, Windsor County Senate District. Wonderful. Thank you. Sarah Kleinman. Uh, I'm with UVM Extension. I'm the director of 4-H Family and Farm Worker Education Programs, includes migrant education, and a portfolio of different programs um, that build youth and family skills. So thank you for having us. We're here. Um, I didn't know that everything was going on today about um, vaping and e-cigarettes. Oh, and there's 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 there. always something going on. Well, that I know, but I, this is really apropos um, yeah. that we're here today to talk about our program called Prosper. Uh, which is, and you all have, I believe, a, a PowerPoint presentation. PROSPER is an evidence-based partnership model that facilitates evidence-based prevention, drug and alcohol prevention programs in schools uh, and in communities. It um, was developed initially through Iowa State and Penn State as a partnership. And the intent is that you build a, a very intentional community team with a strong partnership between Extension, the Land Grant College, and a school in a given community. And the community team ultimately makes decisions about which evidence-based programs. There's a family program that targets fifth and sixth graders, and then it's followed up with an in-school program for seventh graders, um, all, both of which build strong families and uh, protective factors for both the family function, the family unit, as well as the youth. We have been doing this since 2012. Um, Extension was approached by some other land grants across the country uh, as a state that was ready to deploy. They looked at a variety of factors, um, part of it being the rural nature, part of it the economic breakup of our state, and then other data and statistics. And uh, it was determined that Vermont is a state that should try this. And it's been incredibly successful. It is um, not a very cheap program. It costs about $30,000 to implement in a given community. And we have been um, able to apply for a number of different grants. So we're running it currently in, and I have to look at my map, we have three sites that have been established since about 2012. We have two new sites that are just getting up and running, and we're looking for one more location.
education given the funding. We have um, a large USDA grant, actually two of them called the CIFAR grant, Children, Youth, and Families at Risk, that funds the majority of our efforts. Uh, Children's Trust Fund funds a site in Camels Hunt Middle School in Richmond. Um, of course, uh, the CIFAR, one of the CIFAR sites is up in Linden that Amy will speak about. Uh, where else are we? We're up in Derby with some SAMHSA dollars. That's a pass-through through Iowa State. That's a new effort. We are in Rutland Northeast Supervisory Union at Otter Valley. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting one. Camels Hunt. Linden. I'm sorry, I've got my map right in front of me, but I did not wear my glasses. Um, <laughs> so they're there. <laughs> and we are trying to intentionally target up in the Northeast Kingdom. And St. John's Day, thank you. That's one of our newest sites as well. Okay. Um, so ultimately, and I'm on page two now, you all know that the opioid crisis is in the news. Um, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey data just came out for 2019. Um, we might be seeing a drop in alcohol and drug use, but we are seeing an increase in vaping, and we're seeing an increase in mental health issues. And we know that mental health is often a link and tied to substance use and abuse. Uh, and then I'm also aware of the Vermont Youth Survey that Vermont After School is leading in a number of communities, and the data that has come from those that research study is a direct link to what YRBS is telling us as well as the information that we're seeing. Um, ultimately, that we need to provide solid youth engagement opportunities and we need to provide protective programs that build protective factors and build connectedness in schools. And that's exactly what um, PROSPER is doing. On the third slide I have, if you're familiar with UVM Extension, for many years we have our 4-H program and we build positive youth development opportunities for kids all across the state in a variety of ways. We also have some family skill building. We run a program called Coping with Separation and Divorce and there's a variety of other family opportunities. Um, rarely have we moved into the substance abuse prevention world or behavioral health, but if you take those that aspect of it, through positive youth development and through protective factor development, and you merge it with the work that Extension has been doing with community partners and with schools, you really get this incredible partnership that's called PROSPER. And again, it's, it's an evidence-based delivery, so we're intentional about how we build the team and the evaluation that we do and the attention that we give the team while we're delivering these particular programs. Ultimately, PROSPER builds connectedness in a community because it brings families together, um, both high-functioning and lower-functioning families. They come together for a meal, they, there's childcare available, we try to take away any barrier possible for a seven-week session called Strengthening Families. And these um, parents have some time on their own, the youth have time on their own, and then they come together for an uh, opportunity where the family unit learns, they build uh, values, they work, do some activities together to really try to reinforce uh, limits and behaviors and commonalities that are important to the family. On the fourth slide, you can see the evidence, what the evidence-based partnership model, and ultimately Prosper has two goals. There's a goal about delivering the program, and then again, there's a goal about the team. I'll get to another slide that talks about the return on the investment, but what's different about Prosper is, again, this intentionality to the team. There are many coalitions and many amazing work being done where evidence-based programs are being delivered in schools or in standalone community spaces. Um, but again, the difference here is that we make sure that everybody feels valued that's a part of this community team, that there's a role to play, uh, and it tends to sustain itself a lot longer than an just a standalone evidence-based program. Um, I had been participating on the Governor's Opioid Coordinating Council prior to the report and the uh, recommendations being developed, and everything that PROSPER is doing was recommended there. Um, we are a primary prevention program. There is a link between stress and substance use. Uh, we are promoting youth and community connections, and of course the wellness and health in schools uh, because of the strong connection to the school unit is uh, happening here in Prosper. I will say since the council was disbanded, um, and I know that there was a new act that created a new sort of governing body, I don't know what's happening anymore. And so that's a, it's kind of a standalone question that I have now. Um, I'm not connected to the work that's being done, and so I, I am curious about how we people, find out. How people know, learn about We need to connect you with them. It that would be the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was functioning really, really well, and it could still be functioning really well, but I, the, the information being released from this new entity, I'm not sure where that goes or how they're, they're getting that. organized. They've just hired a manager, um, and so I don't know what outreach they've done to okay. organizations that they've worked with previously, but okay. we'll, we're gonna, we'll be following up on that, and I'm glad you mentioned it. Thank you. That's helpful. 
Um, so on the, the next slide, uh, here's some of the data that comes out of, Ros uh, out of Prosper. Um, it, there's a host of, if you follow the two programs with fidelity, because it is evidence-based, you're guaranteed to get certain results. Um, and so we know youth in this particular program, they're better at problem solving. They're less likely to get into trouble or hang out with classmates that get into trouble. <coughs> Prosper communities have a positive peer pressure effect. So even if you're not a direct participant in the programs that we deliver, ultimately community members are going to benefit because you'll start to have that positive peer pressure about um, not engaging in particular risky behaviors such as vaping. And so you'll see communities are better off. Um, again, the two programs, the family program is Strengthening Families. It's out of Iowa State. And then we use Batman's Life Skill, which is an in-school program. Most of the schools will deliver it during guidance class or health class. And all seventh graders receive that particular benefit. Uh, there is also, if you look at the next slide, you can see that Prosper communities are doing better off uh, both where it comes to opioid misuse as well as drug, uh, specifically drug use. So there is a direct correlation between having the Prosper interventions um, and not. And then in the, the documents that I shared previously, there's much more um, evidence and specific research. But we've been running this since 2012. We've reached over 12,000 youth in fifth, sixth, and seventh grades, plus their families. There's a 960 return on investment for every dollar. Um, and that's based upon uh, the number of youth that are no longer engaging, perhaps, in the judicial system or in um, hospitals or in treatment centers. Uh, so it is incredibly impactful. Uh, we also know that for every 100 youth in a for community, 21 of them are less likely to misuse opioids. So there is a very um, impactful, positive effect of this. Um, what else can I tell you? 100% of participants learn some sort of behavior change. They know how to how to communicate better with their youth. They're, um, everybody, people are emphasizing uh, empathy is increasing from parent to youth, which helps to reduce anxiety levels and, and mental health and just family functioning, which of course is a trickle effect down. And I'm gonna at that, turn it over to Amy, who can share um, specific can examples. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So on your last slide, you say reach over 1,200 fifth, sixth. Sorry, grade. yes. Is that 12,000? No, it is 1,200. My it apologies. 1200. It is 1,200. Okay. All right. So, yep. All right, good. Thank you. Sure. Hi, I'm Amy Gale. I'm the principal at Linden Town School, which is up in the northeastern corner of the state in Lindenville. And I've been principal there for 11 years and was there when Prosper first came to our school. We're a high poverty school, typically between 55 and 65 of our student population, 500 students um, are on free and reduced lunch, sometimes as high as 70% of our students are on free and reduced lunch. Um, and I'm just gonna tell you some stories about some families that have participated in PROSPER. When we started with PROSPER, we decided to Im implement it as part of the sort of the step up from coming from fifth grade into sixth grade, which in our school students move up to the next floor where sixth, seventh, and eighth is, so we call it Step Up and Prosper. And we encourage all of the families and students that are in fifth grade going into sixth grade to participate in that. We have some opportunities for them to come and learn about it and sign up, but it's totally volunteer. Um, but we always have a good uh, number of students and their, and their families who come. Uh, typically, we run two sessions in the fall. Um, so I'm going to tell you about, and I'm changing names here, I'm going to tell you about Julia who came to Prosper and she came with her grandmother because um, her mom is an addict and was no longer able to care for Julia and her two sisters, one who was an infant. But Julia was moving into seventh, uh, sixth grade, and so um, Graham and Julia came to Prosper. They completed all of the sessions. They participated in that. It was a great experience. Julia comes from a different, a difficult family situation, but she has some real leadership opportunities and characteristics, and she's been able, through the program, was able to participate fully and to be a student leader, not only in the program, but also as she went through sixth, seventh, and eighth grade in our building and now is off into high school. 
um, Graham participated two years later with the next youngest sister and this time mom was able to come to some of those sessions with them because she's working on you know being in rehab and getting her life back together and uh, and so we see that family who are going through very difficult struggles able to come to those sessions to to get their dinner to to get some new learning and to practice it in their home which has some real challenges I'll tell you the story of another student um, this student it I'll um, call um, Caleb so Caleb was newly reunited with his dad uh, he had been working living in a, a different part of the state with a, a grandfather who was providing care came to live with dad so new school new town sixth grade difficult time to start new but Caleb and his dad came to prosper and through that they were able to connect with other parents um, Caleb was able to join the ball team because there was a parent at Prosper who said I'll pick him up you know dad was working not able to provide transportation so able to make connections with other school um, students as well as community members who helped them to you know feel welcomed into the community and have a better chance of success and through that program to learn some of the skills as a dad reunited newly with his son to help them talk about important issues. Um, a third uh, family that I'll tell you about is um, uh, Jamie and Jamie and his mom came to Prosper. Jamie was one of those kind of bad boy kids getting into trouble, um, argumentative with teachers, lots of challenges at home as well as at school. And I just um, want to tell you that they completed the Prosper program. Jamie's mom actually joined our community team because she was so profoundly affected and felt like their family were profoundly affected by participating in Prosper. And she became part of our community team coming to the meetings and offering the perspective of, of a parent who'd been through the program and, and tearfully told us about how uh, with Jamie getting in trouble at school, now they were able to talk about those issues instead of him just acting out about them. So they gained some communication tools to be able to talk about tough stuff that was happening. And that's part of how we promote the program to parents. We see parents from all socioeconomic levels participate in the program because the commonality that they have is that we're entering those middle school years, we're entering those teen years that we know can be tumultuous and be, can be very, you know, can expose kids to risks that they haven't had before and also at times when they have more freedom than they've had before. So to have the school community through the PROSPER program sort of wrap around them and help the students to learn, you know, some, some skills and some of the uh, behaviors that are gonna help them stay away from those harmful things and to help the parents to learn that and then to bring them back at the end of the evening to practice that together in fun and playful ways um, so that they can go off with skills that are going to help them navigate those difficult times that can come through those middle school years. One part of the program that last um, session is to have a student panel and typically we are inviting high schoolers that have graduated the program and, and you know four and five years ago they went through Prosper to come back and talk to the students that are about to graduate Prosper, the sixth graders. And we hear them telling these sixth graders the things that they learned in Prosper that, you know, sort of like unfolded, especially as they went off to high school and they had some tools in their toolbox to be able to navigate those things. And they had some relationship and communication skills with their parents to be able to talk about those things. So it's been a very powerful program in our school. Um, our school um, personnel, our teachers, our guidance counselors, our school nurse have all been instrumental because they've taken the training to be the facilitators for that and it has just helped to seal the connections between students, parents, and school community so that um, you know when difficulties arise we are um, we're facing those as partners. So it's been fabulous at our school. Terrific. Good. I understand the issues 
you address, and I understand uh, some of the results you've gotten. I'm not clear on what the program itself actually involves. What, what happens when someone participates? So when they participate, as Sarah said, we feed them dinner. So we have sort of a communal dinner together. We provide child care if you need to bring your younger siblings. And then we have facilitators that work with the youth. Let's say we're, we're talking about rules and boundaries. So the facilitators go off with the group of youth and they do some activities, they have some discussion about rules and boundaries, like what's the value of them, when, when do you buck against them, you know, why would your parents be making rules and boundaries, why would the school be doing that? And they also have a separate session, different facilitators at the same time working with the parents around rules and boundaries. And parents get to sit around like this and say, so what do you do about bedtime now that they're in sixth grade? Or what do you do when they're asked to a friend's house and you don't know that friend? And the facilitator is presenting information and, and doing role plays and those kinds of things. So parents get to communicate with each other and get some new learning from the facilitator. And then we bring them back together after those concurrent sessions are happening. We bring the children back with their parents and then we do some activities together that again help them maybe role play something, play a game together, do some kind of activity to help facilitate the um, just making real what they just learned over here as they practice that together as parent and child and or grandparent and child. It's a seven week session. So graduation is technically um, provided if you attend five of the seven sessions. And that's the family program. And, and so typically about 20% of the school grade population would participate in the family program. And then the following year in seventh grade, all students in seventh grade participate in another protective factor um, for social building uh, curriculum as well. One of the things that we started um, after after we had done Prosper, I, I mean, I I thought it sounded like a great program, but we're never going to get people to come seven weeks in a row. It's not going to happen. People don't do that. But they did come seven weeks in a row. And uh, we quickly realized that we needed to have kind of a reunion. And so uh, typically in the spring, we will have an evening where parents and kids are invited to come back. And we were blown away with how many showed up for that and the kids even now are clamoring for when are we doing the reunion we need to do a reunion so they really it's a meaningful time for them and they come back they crave more they love to come back together with their parents one of the things that we consistently hear from parents is it was so nice to have something to do with just Johnny or just Susie you know because it's it's for them and the younger children are you know taken somewhere else for child care and it really helps parents and kids to bond in a new way over really meaningful topics. So. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I, it sounds, sounds fabulous. And I, um, you know, your comment about you didn't think people were going to come, uh, I was just thinking sometimes these sorts of programs uh, are kind of preaching to the choir because the people who, you know, are already engaged in that sort of thing are the ones yeah. who, who come. But, uh, but yeah. you found that people who, who, who could really benefit a lot from it also. Yeah, and, and, and the other thing that sometimes happens is you get a group of people and then those who maybe have stronger families already don't come. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, you've got a divide there. But we have really found that this, because of that commonality of every kid is going through middle school, every kid is going through those tumultuous teenage years and every parent is kind of like, okay, what's coming? And that sort of brings everybody together to sit around a table with people that you maybe not socially associate with, um, but you're all talking about really critical issues because you love your kids and you want the best for them. So we have found that it crosses those socioeconomic lines in really wonderful ways and makes some relationships that can last over you know, the next three years as their kids go through middle school together. Right. And, and so the funding for your program, this is probably have to be the last question as our time is going over, but the funding for this, the $30,000 that um, you indicated, is that something that the school district puts in or is it a grant from the extension? Initially, it all came from grants. Uh -huh. At this point, I, I have over the years with the success of the program, 
snuck a little into my budget so that like this next year's budget, seven thousand dollars is in there wow. to promote, you know, to, to support Keep the program. Going. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you for your good work too. Thank you. Yes. And this is, this links in with a lot of the stuff that we've been doing in this community with the after school program yes. and yeah. then the prevention council. So when the prevention council folks come in, we'll make sure that we talk about Prosper and what's going on. Are you linked with them? So that, that would be super. Great. That would be great. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much.